Pete, just to start off with, I did a little research, and from what I was able to find out, you went to your first race at Martinsville back in the early 60s or so? Well, as far as a cup race, yes. Okay. Um, I went there when I was 10 years old, so that would have been in 63. Okay. Um, I remember when they had the metal awning over the front stretch. Dad, Dad actually took me. He had a, a AMC Valiant station wagon. And uh, back in, you just went to the race whenever you was ready to go. And I can remember him coming in saying, uh, I got tickets to the race. Do you want to go? And, uh, of course, I wanted to go. And uh, so we went, and uh, I got to see Fireball. I got to see Fred, Fred Lorenzen, which was my favorite person at the time. I loved him because he had a uh, white and baby blue car. And... Uh, Several other uh, people uh, went down into the pits afterwards. Then that's when I, you know, said, "All right, met Herb." Now I wanted Herb's autograph. Herb wouldn't give it to me. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> so you know, later on, I, yeah. I knew Herb, and yeah. I never will forget. I went up to him. I said, "I shouldn't even say anything to you." I said, "You've been a butthole in my life ever since." He said, "What are you talking about?" And I told him the story. He said, well, you have to understand, I was under a lot of stress then. I said, no, you weren't. <laughs> I said, back then, it wasn't the stress. Yeah. I don't yeah. know where you're coming up with this stuff. Yeah. And he apologized. And he said, you want it now? I said, no, I never made it this long without it. I can go <laughs> on. So I got him back finally. But, yes, yeah, so I went to the first race when I was 10. Now, at what point did you decide that you wanted a career in this sport? When I was about... 14. Okay. 13, 14. I tried playing a little football. I found out I didn't like getting hurt. I was playing. I, I loved football. I mean, because at the time, I never thought I'd get into racing. Yeah. And uh, my uncle and my dad, they had cars. They ran Franklin County. They ran Pulaski. They ran Hillsville. And they had all, they went to South Boston. And they went everywhere. And, of course, I tagged along. And uh, I really got to the point where I loved doing it. You know, it was like the heck with schoolwork. I can have more fun doing what I'm doing as far as, you know, going to the racetrack with them. Did you ever want to drive? No, I never wanted to drive. Never had no ambition to even think about getting in one and driving. <laughs> but... Um, there's times that people have asked me, you know, you don't go out there and warm the brakes up or do something like that. And I, uh, I get out there and get it in my blood. I want to drive. <laughs> and I'm with my temper and everything. Nah, you think Danny Hamlin's bad. You ought to see me as a driver. <laughs> <laughs> now, from what I've read, Junior Johnson hauled moonshine for your dad? Mm hmm Yes. How did that come about? I don't know. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. He uh, he started out, and uh, Dad, when he, my Dad, I'm very proud. I'm, we never had a good relationship, but I'm very proud of him because he was uh, honor guard, and he guarded the tomb of the unknown soldiers. Huh. And uh, then he became he was in he then he became like a bodyguard for Eisenhower. Really? Yeah, and then. Mama moved to Washington to work at the newspaper so she could be with Dad. Because when you was an honor guard, you never knew what, you know, you ain't supposed to leave their little barracks they had. But, like, when you were given the opportunity, he could go see Mom right up the street. Well, next thing you know, I'm coming. And Daddy always told me I ruined his life when I come into the life because he was going to make a career out of his army. So when Mama had me, they moved back home to Virginia, and Daddy didn't really know anything else to do. And so my grandfather, and up there in the mountains where we lived, that's what you did. And yes, Junior, uh, the way I understand it, Junior did haul some for him. And Junior knew all my family, all my yeah. All of the worldlies. 
Yeah. They were uh, kin to my grandmother and uh, Satch Whirly. Yeah. Okay, Satch's, it was Satch's uh, uncles and stuff that were in with Junior on doing it. Buford Whirly was one of them. And, and Junior and him were pretty tight. And when I went to work at Junior's, of course, we talked about that a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, You're from Franklin County, Rocky Mountain. I'm right? from born and raised in uh, right above Burham. Um, moved to where we had running water when <laughs> down toward Rocky Mountain Wadesboro. Yeah. And uh, we moved there, and I remember in 60, we was living there when I went to my first race. So we moved there in 62, I think. Well, then moonshine was big in Franklin County. Oh, my County. God, Franklin County at one time, man. I can think, sit here and name all kinds of people that were doing it. Yeah. Now, I read a story where you had actually landed a job at the cup level before somebody discovered that you were 15 or so? Yes. yes. Now, what was that all about? Who was the job with, and what was your plan? Well, my plan was to – I had talked to Buddy, and I seen that Buddy died uh, yesterday, I guess it was. He did? Yes. Buddy. Aaron. 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 I didn't know that. Yeah. And uh, – you know, I I went, I really, as quick as I could drive down, I went down there and talked to him. But nobody wanted to hire me because I was 15. I had to be 16 to get a NASCAR license. So I just went back home. and. Now, had you already dropped out of school or had no, you? Okay, okay. No, okay. no, not then. I was making that transition. <laughs> <laughs> I was getting ready. That's the way you were headed. That's where I was headed. I was going to head that way. Yeah. But um, I didn't. And uh, when you're young like that, you know, people think you're just full of crap anyway. And you ain't going to be worth a darn. Yeah. How did you finally land up at the cup level? Well, Satch was driving for Buddy Son. Uh, he was driving Bob Johnson's car up, up north and modified and stuff like that. And... Um, Really, I had been working with, like, uh, Hubert Hensley mm -hmm. and Jimmy. I was working with him. William Mason was a modified owner. And, um, you know, just trying to learn as much as I possibly could learn. But I never will forget, was at Trenton, New Jersey, in 77, probably, I guess it was. And... Satch was driving Bob Johnson's modified. And they ran during what they called the Race of Champions in Trenton, New Jersey at the time. And um, we were standing there after the race. We was loading stuff up, and this big old limo like pulled up in front of us. And uh, back glass rolled down. This guy says, hey, how y'all doing? Well, I wasn't doing too good. I didn't win, you know, so. He says, uh, can y'all meet me? He says, I'm Jack Beebe. Can y'all meet me down here at the diner? Maybe for supper I'll buy y'all's dinner before y'all head back. And Satch was the only one going to head back. I was going to stay up there, you know, with Bob. And uh, we did. We loaded and we said, I don't know who this guy is. So we go up there and we sit down. And Jack introduced himself to his wife and several other people was with him. And he explained to us that he owned, his wife actually owned racehorses, and he owned the business of uh, owning all the school buses in the state of Connecticut. And and we talked in, we thought, well, this cat's got money. He said, what I really want to know is how much would it cost me to start a team, race team? Bob said, well, well it, ain't, it ain't that bad, you know. He said, no, I ain't talking about modify. I want to run against Richard Petty and people like that. Wow. And um, Bob sat back, you know, and he says, are you serious? He said, well, I'm, just, I'm serious. I gave it a lot of thought, and that's what I want to do. And people told me that you would be a good man to do it, and Satch would be a good driver. 
So we thought, well, he's still just full of crap. And Bob told him, you know, he had to buy a car, a couple cars, and start, you know, building the team. And he said, uh, I forgot how much money he said. He said, uh, have you got a check on you? <laughs> and, of course, Bob did, so he could pay the tire bill and things like that. And so he uh, he told uh, Bob that a certain amount of money, I didn't hear the exact amount, would be in his account the next morning, personal checking account, so he could get started. And that's how Race Hill Farm started. No he kidding. went to Rainier Racing. He bought a couple cars from Herb, of all people. And I'm not sure, I think Lenny Pond was driving in, or, yeah. or Baker, one of the two. Yeah. And bought a couple motors, and we ran like six races. With Satch? Mm -hmm. Okay. And we went to Dover and finished like in the top ten, went to Pocono and finished the top ten. You know, we weren't doing bad for a bunch of dummies. <laughs> really, you know, and Bob was, you know, Bob was, Bob was Bob. He was. Yeah. Well, a lot of people did not like Bob because he, he's kind of, me. I think that's one reason me and Bob and people like Jake Elder and I got along good. We all told everybody what we were thinking, not what they wanted us to say. <laughs> and, you know, eventually that's what caught up with me in my career. I never would say what. People wanted me to say, I just tell them what I thought. Yeah. And nowadays, especially, they don't want you to say that. Not like it was back then. Right. Tell me a good Bob Johnson story. Because I've heard so much about him. I never met him. Um, he, I think he was kind of transitioning out of the sport by the time I come in. Uh, but you're, you're right. I, I have heard that he did have a temper. What's a well, what's it, a really good Bob Johnson story? Bob Johnson wasn't really that mean a guy. He was just so competitive, especially when it comes to a race car. You know, he, he built wood stoves for actual living. And um, <laughs> several stories. I mean, one time we was at Daytona, July 4th. And uh, we was running, and we couldn't – needed a different gear. Well, we didn't have one. So Bob grabbed – a gear, we went to the motel that night on the back of a pickup truck. He was building it, and the gear fell over and broke two of his fingers. But he finished building that gear. And then also, I know of times that we would be riding down the road in the tow truck, well, not the tow truck, but back with the modified then, on the back. Gussie, his wife, would always sit in the middle. I mean, Gussie was, was secretly a cussing on you long before Bob could. <laughs> and we would be driving, and Bob would not let anybody else drive. And there was times I woke up, Bob would be laid over asleep, and Gussie's driving in the middle of the truck. Wow. You know, and she would wake him up if we had to stop or get out of the way or run over somebody. But, yeah, he'd, he'd get ready to take a nap. He'd say, Gussie, you drive for a while. And she'd grab a wheel and start driving. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, I got a lot of stories about, oh, best ones was Daytona, too. We was all in the pool after we then left the track. We was laid back. Bob, he, Bob, type person, he just enjoys whatever he was doing, too. And he was laid back in the pool, had his shoulders up on the side of the pool, me and him were talking. And this flock of birds flew over. And one just left a dump right on top of his head right <laughs> here. And, uh, I'll never get that. I started laughing. He looked at me. He was getting madder at the moment. He didn't know what I was laughing at. And I said, Bob, <laughs> I hate to tell you, but a bird just pooped on your head. <laughs> I bet that's <laughs> why you put it. <laughs> I kind of uh, used other words. For I'm trying to be nice here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's supposed to be good luck. Yeah. Right? It's supposed to be good luck. Yeah. We didn't have none, but that was, that was supposed <laughs> to be. Were you still with Race Hill when Ron no. won at Talladega? No. Okay. Right. I had went to – actually, I was uh, with Kenny Childers in, West, in Bluefield, Virginia. Mm -hmm. 
and Mike Porter. I know y'all heard of him. I became his crew chief through through them, and uh, still worked in Cup. But me and I know we're forgetting. Me and Porter went to Martinsville. Eighty, nineteen eighty, I guess it was. And they had that two fifty lap race back in. And, Is that the uh, sportsman? Yes, yeah, what's okay. called sportsman. Yeah. They had two hundred and fifty lap modified, two hundred and fifty lap. Yeah, yeah. The double sportsman. header. Double yeah. header they called yeah. it. Yeah. And we went down there, had a brand new car, had the B and R motors, and uh, went down there and qualified. Ronnie Revis from B and R was with us and <laughs> Bear Hunley went with us. We just had a good group, and Bear had been with L.D. Ollinger a lot, you know, when he was starting to drive. And um, we qualified, went out there and practiced, and we were able to make good. And Mike said, man, he says, what can we do to get better? So we talked about it, and we said, we're going to run left side. Back then, it wasn't no really no big rule. We're going to run left sides on the right and left. 42s, they called them. We could either run 42s or 41s, which everybody else was going to run. And we chose, out of all the cards in the race, to run 40, uh, 42s all the way around. So we went out there and they started racing. He fell back. Didn't get laughed nothing. He just stepped back there. And they had cautions and they had this. And he was still just putting along. Finally, it was about 50 to go. And old Ronnie Rev says, well, Porter, you got anything you need to show us, you need to do it now. He come up through there like a bat out of, you know, getting it. And uh, actually won the race. And people could not believe we won the race on that soft a tire. But he just took care of them all day. Drove a good race. Didn't wear them out. So the next week we go to Charlotte. I'm standing on the sign-in thing, ticket where you go in. And uh, Jack Ingram's in front of me. And he turned around and looked at me and he said, Boy, there ain't no way y'all won that race on 42s last week. He says, Y'all cheated somewhere. Y'all changed the numbers on them tires. You did something because there ain't no damn way. I said, No, Jack, we actually ran 42s all the way around. No, you didn't. He said, I run, he said, I'm leading the race. And he passed me like I was sitting still. And he said, I know y'all didn't run 42. And I said, yeah, we did. He said, you're a lying SOB. Except he didn't use the SOB. I said, Jack, you call me what you want. But we got the trophy. <laughs> and from then on, I could see Jack. And Jack would just look at me and shake his head. Uh-huh. I never will forget he come to, oh, we was running Chase Elliott. At Greenville Pickens, not long back, Bo Chase moved up in K and N car, and they had Jack there as honorary starter at Greenville Pickens. They bring him in on this golf cart, and I'm standing down there beside the car. And he had the guy on the golf cart bring him down there to see me. He said, looked at me and said, "You still lied to me." I said, "No, <laughs> I did not." And I said, "Jack." Get your hands back up there where you belong. Leave me alone. But he never forgot that. Now, who were you working with? Mike Porter. Uh, 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 when you saw Jack at the... the... Uh, Chase Elliott. Okay. All right. Because that's what we did when I was at Hendricks. Okay. There was five of us that raced Chase Elliott. We ran K&N, late model trucks, uh, ARCA. Mm-hmm. We ran everything. All Rick wanted was to get Chase seat time. He didn't care what it was in. He wanted to get seat time. Deal. How did you wind up over at Hagen's? Right. Well, I quit Porter's. Um, the coal strike come in. Everybody started losing money. Nobody wanted to spend money, kind of like days today. And uh, Daryl Bryant was over there. Daryl talked to me about coming to work there. Well, they fired Daryl. And hired Jack Elder. And I had been working with Jake. He'd come up there to Ken Cole racing some after Doc, he left Doc Arts. And uh, he, uh, uh, he basically 
had worked with me and all, and he says, when he left, he told me, he said, just hang in there. I'm, I'm going to get you with me. And me and Jake had a very good relationship. A lot of people didn't, but me and him did. And sure enough, when he got down there, he called me and said, you ready to go to work? I said, yeah. He said, well, come on. So I went down there, and I had just gotten married the first time. So she stayed up there while I moved to uh, Thomasville. And you're talking about an experience. That was an experience. I didn't have nowhere to live. I had only the clothes in my car, you know. And I stayed with Eddie Dickerson and his wife, Carol. I stayed with them a while. I stayed uh, with Terry and Kim a while. Terry, you know, we, we had met earlier and I really liked the men, but we eventually, you know, got, got together and I stayed there until the middle of 85 and I left because Jeff Hammond was going to have a knee operation and they were going to need somebody to jack. He said, Junior wants to talk to you. I said, well, he knows where I'm at. Junior come up to me later on. We was at some Charlotte or somewhere. He said, "Buddy, says Pete says uh, I heard you're a good Jack man." I said, "Well, I don't know if I'm that good. I just like doing it." He said, "Well, I said I want you to jack my race car." He said, "Hammond's getting ready to have that surgery, and I want you to come jack for it." Now on the lip, the eleven car or the twelve car? Eleven car. Okay. And he says, uh, I said, well, I said, we just won the championship and all. I got a pretty good deal. I mean, Steve Mill, like co-crew chiefs, and Edmund had done gone back to the petties and everything. And he says, uh, well, how much money do you make? And I told him, he said, boy, I doubled that. I said, I see you Monday. <laughs> <laughs> but I waited another week, did another job, and we went to Pocono. No, we'll forget we're at Pocono. Sandy Jones changed tires and Mike Hill. Daryl Andrews, of course, was the tire carrier. And right before the first pit stop, you know, I went early, worked on the car just like I'd always done. Worked on the, twi- on the 11, car 11 car with Daryl. Yeah. And me and Daryl had known each other a long time. And I thought the world of Daryl and Stevie. And uh, he... Uh, getting ready to make the first pit stop. Well, Mike Hill and Sandy Jones walked up to me and says, listen, don't make us wait on you. I said, okay. So we were running six at the time. I mean, you had Tim, he had a good bunch of guys out there, Harry Gant and all of them, you know, and they were running good, Bobby Allison. And so we were running about six. And that's suppose they had pit road speed, they had anything, caution comes out. They all hit pit road at the same time. Well, when the caution come up, of course, they bunched up a little bit, but they hit pit road. And here they come. We changed tires, went back out. Nobody said that to me. I said, Jack, man. I seen Junior. Junior motioned to Sandy and Mike said, come here. They walked over right to him, and he pointed that big old scoreboard. We were leading the race. And from there on, I was accepted at Junior, Junior Johnson. We went from, we gained that many spots in the pits for my first time working with them, and they never accused me of being slow again. Please tell me that you, that you had to wait on Sandy and Mike to finish. Well... <laughs> I've never seen that. <laughs> they were okay. They, I'll say it for you. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, you know, back then we had left side. We changed left side tires. Yeah. You know, we had a left side van taking off the tires. Uh, Shorty Edwards of all people. Yeah. And he took off the left sides, and uh, you know, back then after they were done, they were done. So I had to go over and be ready, you know, and uh, it was hard back then. All right, going back to 1984, you were the chassis specialist for Billy Hagen. Yes. Steam and Terry Mm -hmm. Labonte. What was it like working with Steve Mill and Dale Emmons? Oh, let me tell you something. 
Dale Linman was like a dad to me. Really? Dale Linman was the most, he was such an organizer and such a great person. He took in, he took, he kind of took care of me, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I remember in 83 when he come there, I used to ride with him all the time. Well, he just, I don't know what it was. Me and Dale were just close. We were tight. And, I mean, there was times I know we would get with Michigan, staying at the Tecumseh the and right one way from the racetrack there. And Dale was the type he believed in the race team doing things together. It was no, I did this, I did that, I went here, I went there. You did it as a team. And that was part of the petty that was in him. And uh, he, uh, <laughs> we come out, we're going to go eat supper. Okay, I come out. He always made me ride shotgun. I jumped in. He looked at me and he says, well, I'm glad to see you can make it. You know, I was the last one there, of course. He says, uh, you're not going to wear them shoes to eat, are you? I said, what are you talking about, shoes? He said, "That's they're bad. I said, well, that's the only thing I got, Dale. You don't pay me enough to wear shoes, good shoes. You know, kind of joked me. He said, okay, I'll fix that. I thought, then, well, I'm going to get a raise. Well, he backed out, went straight across the street, and there was a shoe store over there. He took me in there and bought me a pair of shoes. <laughs> we come back out, and he said, now we can go eat. <laughs> and uh, Dale was just, I don't know, I love Dale. I talk to him now. Mm -hmm. He called me a couple weeks ago, I don't know how I was doing, and... Uh, I don't know. It was just a great relationship working for Dale. Um, and Steve, me and Steve got along great. We roomed together. Um, I don't know what it was about Dale, but he just, he was such a good organizer. We didn't, we went with 14 of us there. That's including the engine room. 14 people, truck driver and secretary were included. And I think it was three people in the engine room. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was so organized that we didn't work no crazy hours. We spent weekends together. We had some weekend help like Billy Siler and uh, the Hughes, Odie Hughes and Frank Hughes. That's Clayton's daddy, Odie. And uh, that was it. And Dan Gatewood. And so he just was such a – we didn't – like I said, it, it was just – the way all that team fell together and the work we did together, it was just a great combination. I mean, and you could not ask for a better group of people to try to beat for the championship than Harry Gant and his bunch. Because I had watched Harry drive late models and modif he drove William Mason modified a couple times at North Carolina and things like that. And... It was just so much fun racing against them. And, uh, but as far as working with Dale, if I ever <laughs> uh, had the chance, I mean, just like when he got inducted into the Hall of Fame, he, you know, gave me an invitation. And uh, that's just the kind of relationship I had with him. And Steve Mill, uh, we don't talk much anymore because he's got his hands full right now with, you know, his family and all, and Shane. And, uh, but as far as you know, I love working with him, mm -hmm. especially Dale. So, 1984, was there a specific moment or race where you got the sense that winning the championship might be a possibility? Or did that just develop over time? It just developed over time. Um, one story I tell people back in 84, we were at Charlotte. And like I said, we had little spits and spats. And we at that time, we had a guy named Walter Wood as an associate sponsor mm -hmm. on the C-Post. And 
he was a movie producer. And he helped Hal and them produce Smoke and the Bandit. And uh, so we had a common deal together. But we at Charlotte, and Hal was always trying to mess with us. Well, it was after practice in the old garage. You remember that old raggedy garage we had there? And uh, we was working on the car, and this big limo pulled up behind our car. And uh, all of a sudden, this big black guy gets out. And he's wearing a top hat, <laughs> and he's, he's got a cane. Yeah. And I didn't know what was going on. And he come over to our car. We kind of step back, and he starts mumbling a bunch of stuff and, and tapping the car with his cane. Voodoo. And he was, he was a voodoo doctor, they yeah. said. All right, was so, it Travis Carter that was telling us about him? Uh, Might have been. I'm but Dale sure. will tell you about that guy. Yeah. Dale yeah. Lemon. Yeah. Ooh. And I also, I didn't sit there and watch. I done, you know, had a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in this season. And we're going, and I want to win the championship. And he kept talking that. And I told him to go get back in the car. I said, go get your butt back in the car and get away from us. He just kept doing the thing. Well, I reached down and took the jack handle out of the jack. I was going to run him back to the car. Well, he didn't see him. He didn't piss me off. So he went back to the car. And Dale Enman went to the NASCAR trailer and told Dick Beatty, he said, you best get him out of this garage because Pete's going to kill him. <laughs> and then I went over and gave Hal Neenham and Travis them a piece of my mind. They laughed like crazy. But I did. I told him, I said, you get your butt back in that car now? I'll key. I was shaking that jack handle at him. And he left. And that was, I mean, Dale Emmett to that day says, he ain't never seen me as mad as I was that day. Well, Terry clinched the championship at Riverside with a third place finish. Right. How did it feel to be on the top of the world, the racing world at that time, for you personally? For me, it was very, uh, I kind of didn't know how to handle it at first because it was so big. I mean, it happened. It was, we're champions. And I think Bud Morning won the race that day. And, uh, but it didn't really sink into me that we'd won the championship. Oh, we went back to the motel and we partied all night. And I can remember Terry crawling up the steps to get to his room. And <laughs> it was just uh, a big party. And Billy Hagen, he's taking champagne bottles and taking the tops and trying to knock the chandelier lights out and all this crap, you know. So the next day, we had to catch a flight back home. Of course, it was on Piedmont Airline. Direct flight back to Greensboro. And it didn't really hit me until we got to Greensboro and, seen all, and we get off the plane and all these people are there. And they're standing with dad holding my son. He wasn't about six months old at that time. Mm -hmm. And that's when it hit me, really, that we had we had won the championship. We were champions. We were going to New York. And uh, that's basically, you know, parts feeling like on top and stuff. You know, it was just to get home is when you really realized that you had accomplished what, said, what we set out to do. Right. That team evidently had some money problems along the way. How much of that were you aware of? Then we weren't aware of it as much. But you take, we won like three or four races that year, won the championship, and we still didn't win $712,000 for the whole year. I think our sponsorship from Piedmont Airlines was like seventy-five to 100000 if it was that much. It wasn't nothing, but they furnished us airplanes and flew us to races and things like that, which was a big help. But when I first went to Billy Hagen's, he had money. The oil, the oil business was great. And, you know, he was really doing good with his deal. And all of a sudden, him and Nancy got a divorce, and money started being scarcer and scarcer. 
Um, when I went back over in 93, we, we raced off few parts, used parts that Bill Davis had. We hardly ever had anything new to run on. It was, you know, it was, <laughs> I don't see how they raced to then. Because Billy owed everybody. And when I went back over there, you know, everybody said, well, you better be careful, you know, stuff like that. But I don't know what, Billy was a racer. Ain't no question about it. He spent a lot of money in that IMSA division back then. And Tex Powell took care of their cars. And Gene Felton drove for them. Kelly Arbor drove for them in the 24-hour race. Pearson. I mean, he had a lot of good drivers. And then, like I said, after the divorce and all of a sudden uh, the uh, refineries and all started cutting back a little bit at that time, it was, uh, it was just money after money. It was hard for him to come up with. Well, you touched on it <clears throat> this before, but uh, how did you get over to juniors? Was the money problem at Hagen really getting to you at that time? Was no, no, okay. it really wasn't. It was just the fact that I was going to work for Junior Johnson. And to this day, I'll tell you right now, that was the best. I worked for Rick Hendricks. Rick Hendricks was a great guy. But that place was so big, mm -hmm. it was unbelievable. Everything that Junior Johnson did, everybody knew about it. He involved his team in financial, you know, especially me, Brewer, Mike Hill. We was all, and Beecher Hatton, we was always involved in what was going to happen. If we hired somebody, we're going to hire somebody, we all had to kind of give our input on that person. Like when we started the 22 team, we, you know, hired uh, uh, Flash, the shoemaker, you know, Tony Shoemaker and different people like that. And we all gave the input on each one that we hired at that time. But that was just the way Junior operated. And, uh, but no, as far as going to Juniors, it had nothing to do with money. It was the fact that I liked Daryl. I liked Mike Hill. And at that time, Jeff Hammond was there. And me and Jeff really had a good relationship. And Brewer was there. You know, he didn't race... He was racing Neil, and uh, that's the main reason I went there. Who was the Junior Johnson that you knew? Junior had a way. I spent a lot of time. I, I used to go uh, coon hunting with him. I'd go up there and run. It was times I'd run a bulldozer for him. It was times we'd go and pick up rock. It was time we'd go get up hay, everything, you know. Junior was Junior. He was the type of person that he had a way of really getting on your butt, but you respected him while he was doing it. We went to uh, Richmond, brand new car. Terry Labonte was driving. We are actually either leading the race or running second. We're running good. He comes down the front straight away. A header breaks off. Blows out the right rear. He backs the car in the wall. Brand new car. And it hurt to her. Next morning, we at work. Stripping the old car. Here, Junior comes. And we hadn't won no races for the last four or five weeks. And... Uh, he comes in there, he looks at the car, and then he looks down. He said, let me tell y'all something, boss. He said, I don't never want to hear y'all talk about drivers anymore. Because for some reason, y'all can't give them the right kind of car to drive without crap breaking, which is the exact words he used, and causing them to lose races. He said, when y'all learn to do that, then we'll start talking about what kind of driver we got. But until then, y'all need to work on what y'all doing. And we were like, holy cow. He basically just told us we didn't get our crap together. He's going to fire us. And uh, then he says, okay, who all wants to go eat? <laughs> so we crawled up in the Suburban. Every one of us. Well, we're going to eat with you, Junior. <laughs> And we went over to Barney Hall's because that's when Barney Hall had a little, over at his golf course, he had a little restaurant. And his mama did a lot of cooking. 
And a sister did cooking, but they had the best pinto beans and cornbread you could ever eat. And we used to go in there and eat. Where was that? It was uh, near Oakland. Uh, it was across the road on 421. I cannot tell you exactly. It was past Clingman. Yeah, I've been there. Okay. Yeah, uh, it wasn't that far from Junior's. It was about a 15 minute drive, probably. It was more or less back behind. Remember Junior building that big mansion? Yeah. It was more or less back in that area. 